Lord, I thank you for today. I thank you, Lord, so much for this time that we have to get in the Word. And Lord, the beauty of what you've been doing in my life and showing me what I need to do. And Lord, I, I just pray that I would remember everything that I need to remember today. And I give it all to you. And Lord, I just give you praise. You are a mighty and an awesome God. And we thank you, Lord, for this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Okay. We're still talking about the kingdom. Uh, yeah. Good stuff. It is good stuff. We, um, we're trying to go through, give the visitors a little bit of a uh, heads up. We're trying to go through the Sermon on the Mount to understand how the kingdom functions. And uh, so as we get into it, um, we're going to see more and more of the uh, of what we've been studying and talking to. And so uh, this will be kind of a capsule kind of a thing. But what we're doing is talk about the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is the realm under a king. Because I hear a lot of messages on the kingdom. A lot of people talk on the kingdom. Yet I bring up one thing about the whole thing about the kingdom. And it rattles our cage. Uh, Mike Sharp, you guys remember Mike. He came here and spoke last January. And when I went out to California, I taught him face-to-face. -face. We went out there. I went out there and for three days. We sat in a, a hotel, and I taught him face-to-face. -face. We didn't have a lot of time to do a lot of ministry stuff, and so we only did the stuff that the Lord really pushed. And when I got into the courtroom and started teaching, teaching him how to forgive and how to do these different things, I told him, I said, someday... We won't have time today, but someday you're going to have to take yourself to the courtroom and forgive yourself. Oh, cool. Now, what happened was about two weeks ago, it's been that long, but two weeks ago, something happened in his life and he got all sorts of upset. And his wife said, why are you so hard on yourself? And, she, and he said, because I haven't forgiven myself, because I got judgments against me, that's why. And she went, what? And he went, it's time, isn't it? <laughs> so he went in, went to the courtroom for himself and forgave himself. Hallelujah. He called me. <laughs> really? <laughs> he really called me and he says, I've got a, a, a praise report for you. And I said, what's that? And he says, my whole life has turned upside down. He says, I realized that everything I was doing in my ministry was for the wrong reason. Oh, my goodness. Everything was for the wrong reason. He was doing it to gain something. Anyway, anyway, he just changed. His, he ha he's a prayer person. He, he prays. Boy, I tell you, he gets up. He's 5 o'clock every morning at the church. Anybody wants to come with him, he's there. And he says, all of a sudden I found out I could actually pray. He had not known the power of prayer until then. So his life has come unglued. So his wife says, really? How's this working? So things are changing through this whole deal. And she is coming unglued to the point where she now goes to the hospital. Remember all the stuff that she had to go to the hospital for? When she goes to visit somebody at the hospital, it doesn't trigger her. Amen. Because when she goes into the hospital, she just, you know, freaks out all the stuff that, you know, just has to really deal with it and then do her ministry and run. Now she goes in the hospital and there's grace happening. She loves going in there and she's touching people's lives. I just want to let you know, this is a little praise report. I wasn't supposed to just, but Mike's doing fine. Thank you. <laughs> so he called me. <laughs> yeah. So he called me this week and he says, he says, I got a praise report. And he doesn't listen when he does this. He just turns on to dump mode. And sometimes I have to say something. And he goes, what? And I have to repeat it because he's not listening. He's, he's dumping. It's really funny. But he said something about the kingdom. And I says, he says about his life being part of the kingdom. And I says, can I challenge that? I says, is it really in the kingdom? Um, what do you mean? You know, and I says, well, the kingdom is a place where the king rules. So what do you have in your life where the king doesn't rule? That's not under the kingdom. There's silence on the phone. I like it when I can make Mike silent. That's pretty impressive. 
The realm of is a place under the king. It's the territory under his supreme rule. If he can't say jump and you say how high on the way up, then you, you're not in the right place. It's not part of the kingdom. When we justify what's going on instead of just listening to what the word of God says, then we're not part of the kingdom. When we aren't willing to do the rules, and not, not just by rules, you understand, we're not doing the things according to the principles of the scripture, then we're not listening and submitting to the king. Okay, I don't know, I've said this every Sunday, this is all review. I've said this every Sunday, and I still don't think we get it, we meaning me and the frog in my pocket also, is I find areas in my life where I'm not listening. And I go, this is the kingdom? We want to walk in the higher realms of dimensions, and, but if we're not willing to obey in the kingdom, we're not going there. Okay? Wow, I'm on preach mode already. That's not good. Okay. What is submitted and obedient to him? Okay? That's what the kingdom is. Heaven isn't out there. Heaven is real close. It's a lot closer than you think. It's wherever he reigns is where heaven, the kingdom of heaven is. It's so close to us, we don't even get it. Okay, it's difficult to determine. It's really hard because we are so linked to the physical to understand where heaven is. But it's not out in the cosmos somewhere. Why? Because Jesus said, from that time Jesus began to preach and to say, repent for the kingdom of heaven has drawn near. The what? The kingdom of heaven has drawn near. It was not near before, but it is now. We're meaning what? We are gaining access to heavenly realms. Now, I know we've been teaching that, and this is just reviewing again and again and again, but this week, I sat down, I was looking at some things and realizing how close are we to the things of God and yet how far away you know I, I'm reminded of the old get smart line I missed it by that much you know but it just it's that same we're so close how close well the word has drawn near means it is close enough to squeeze it means to squeeze to actually put your hand on the kingdom of heaven is within reach it just amazes me. Do we get it? I'm not sure we do. Are we walking in the heavenly realms? Um, if you did this on a percentage basis, just as a fun experiment, don't, don't do this out loud, it's embarrassing. Okay. <laughs> is, if you did this on a percentage basis, how much percentage of the life you live is in the heavenly realms and how much percentage is in the physical realm? Yeah, if we put this on a percentage basis, you know, we like to, to, to act like we're really doing well, but really, we're not really all doing that so well. How much of heaven are we actually living? How much are we getting into? Okay. You've got to change the way you think and live. Are we close enough to heaven? Well, that brings us to a problem. And that is, when I do verse by verse through something, I really like to make sure I do it verse by verse, but I'm not going to. I'm going to skip these two verses. We did the Lord's Prayer or the Model Prayer last week, and then there's two verses right after that to discuss something that happened in that, but it's going to be covered better in just a few weeks, okay? It's all, don't worry. Uh, it's going to be in conjunction with some other verses, and I won't miss it. Trust me. Okay, I will teach it, but I'm not going to get to those two verses today. Okay, I'm going to bypass that. And I, that's unusual for me, but life is interesting. Okay, and then, but we're going to go to verse 16. <coughs> and verse 16 says this, excuse me. When you fast, do not be as the hypocrites with sullen faces, for they disfigure their faces so they may appear to men to be fasting. Truly I say to you that they have their reward. Now, remember he'd been talking about prayer. When you pray, do this. Good works, don't do your good works before men. He's been doing these comparisons about what the religion was doing and how the kingdom was going to do it. That if things are different now in the kingdom. Don't do things the way they have been. We're going to change how they're being done. We're going to change it. Okay. So he says, now when you fast, do not be as the hypocrites. 
I think it's kind of a fascinating little subtle point. It said, when, not if. Not if you fast, but when you fast. Meaning what? It's an automatically understood that you're going to. Now, that's not true in our Christian walk. When we do a fast, we do something special. It's different. No, it's not supposed to be special and different. It's supposed to be common. It's supposed to be something we're doing all the time. Not all the time. That's an expression. All the time means you starve to death. I know this one lady that was working really hard, and her son, um, her husband left her. And her, she was working two different jobs, and her son was sitting home watching TV and wasn't going out and getting a job. And she did this for a couple of years with him. He ate. He did whatever. Didn't ran around. He always took money from her. And did, And she's working these two jobs just to keep things together. And then she got sick. And she couldn't go to work. So she was praying about it. And she says, Lord, what? And the Lord said, well, don't go. Just don't go to work. She says, but, but. And he says, you going to trust me? Oh, yeah, yeah, okay, I'll trust you. So she went in. And her son got up. And she was still in the house. She hadn't gone to work. And he says, what are you doing? She says, I'm sick. He says, well, you need to go to work. And she says, no. What I've decided is I'm just going to sit here. I'm going to take your lead, and I'm just going to sit here and watch TV, do whatever. I'm just going to sit here. And he says, well, what are we going to do? She says, well, I'll tell you this. For the first 60 days, it's going to be a wonderful fast. <laughs> he says, but no, we got to eat. Says, no, we're going to just fast, pray, 60 days. 60 days, by the way, you'll die. I mean, that's, that's starvation. The starv when people have done starvation fasts, started, uh, protests. I think the last one that they had recorded, the guy went for 64 days before he died. Okay, you can go. Go for a while. She said, boy, the first 60 days is going to be an awesome fast. No! He went out that afternoon and got a job. But not as a show to others. When you fast, don't do it as a show to others. Okay? Because what do they do? They, they disfigure their faces. They may appear to men to be fasting. Kimberly has this thing that she does with her face when she wants something real bad. And she goes, do the face. She did, there's that's the face. It's a little puppy dog thing. Well, that's what they do. They just figure their faces like, oh, I'm fasting. Oh. Yeah. Save the drama for your mama, but she smack you too, okay? <laughs> okay. They missed the reason to fast. They brought their fasting into a religious thing, and they did it so that men would be impressed. They missed the whole reason to fast. Now, uh, Mike and Joyce and Derek, you've not seen this before. And I'll get you a copy of this so you can see it. But I'm going to do this rather quickly as we go over it. And if you need more understanding, talk to Jared. Talk to, what's your name again? Jeremiah. That's the second time today I forgot your name. <laughs> Could have wear a name tag. Okay. But uh, I'll go through this rather quickly. But you'll see what we're going for. And that is this. In the body, in the physical realm, we know that we have three dimensions that we play with. Height, width, and depth. Okay? There's three dimensions. We work in it so simply that we just automatic. It's just automatic. You walked in the door. You walked any direction in these two planes you could. You sat up, you stood down. You sat up and stood down. That didn't sound right. You sat down and stood up. There, that makes better sense. Okay? You, you are completely manipulatable in three dimensions. We know them so easy, we don't even think about it. The fourth dimension is time. Now time, we do not have absolute control over. We know time only as a slice. We know the time is called the present. Here we are, the present, here we are. Okay, how fun. But we can see that it works. We see it functioning. But we don't, can't manipulate it real well. We can just march through what time is doing. And no, I'm not gonna get into that because uh, I got more stuff we'll do. 
Oh, come on. <laughs> but we do know that we don't have just a body, but we also have a soul. A little harder to explain, but still becoming more and more prevalent to my understanding is the dimensions of the soul. Our body is how we relate to the environment. So this is all physics. It's all about the physical environment. But the soul is how we relate to other people. And there are dimensions of the soul. There's, we even say this, that a person is a shallow person. And this person has real depth to them. I said, wow, this person is really amazingly large soul. I mean, just, they have substance to them. When we interact with people, we find out just how full and thick and, and complete they are. And when they're all hung up in pains and problems, how diminished their soul is. But when they start getting free, how able in their soul, the way they think, they're freer. In their will, they're freer. In their emotions, they're freer. But the more we get bound up in our soul, the smaller we are in our soul. Kind of a fascinating way of looking at it. But we do have a spirit. Okay, in the spirit realm, we know that there are also three dimensions because we know that there are angels. Um, people show up, you know. They do stuff. They grab things. They, do, they have... It's not just a two-dimensional holograph. They show up and they manipulate things and do things. It's kind of like fun. They burn up things. <laughs> Gideon. You know, they, you know. <laughs> okay. Yeah, kind of fun stuff. You know, they, they, they do neat things. But there is dimension in the spirit realm, but it's such a higher realm of existence, it's harder for us to understand. Very, very powerful. Well, we also know that time is different in the soul. When we're talking, you know, my how time flies when you're having fun. Or my, my how time drags when you're in pain. Uh, our perception of time changes when we're with people, how we're doing different things. But we also know that time is different in the spirit realm. And time is totally fully open. We found that we figured that the three dimensions of time are just like that. They're just dimensions. They're, we're deep. We can travel better. We can actually manipulate time when we're working in soul. Um, working in soul, we've gone back in time with people doing face to face and changed their past. The event stayed the same, but the effect of the past changes. Their pain is gone. The lie that they believed during that event is gone. So we've actually affected a change in the past that makes that effect now in the present. So we've been time traveling. It's kind of neat. When you get into the spirit realm, that's when things get really wild because we don't really know what we're doing there. Okay? <laughs> and we can sometimes go into the future and see things and come back in prophecy. Uh, but time is kind of... When you get into this, it's kind of tricky, okay? I've touched it, seen it touch things, but I can't stay there and work it. So it's kind of, kind of different. Twelve dimensions. How fun. I threw that up on a Facebook thing this last week. <laughs> Somebody said, are there more dimensions? More than the three that we know? He says, um, maybe faith is a dimension. Mike Walsh, by the way, that was who did that. So I kind of threw stuff at him. <laughs> well, that wasn't what he had intended. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> clear up in Seattle. Okay, but we also know that in the physical realm, now these are realms now. The, the physical is a realm. It has its dimensions, but it's a realm. The soul has its dimensions, but it's its own realm. And the spiritual has its dimensions, but it's its own realm. And time has its own dimensions, but it is its own realm, but it transverse, it goes across the board different. So anyway, we have the four realms, spirit, soul, body, and time. How interesting. Now, we had done this with the chart that we'd had before on the body, how the soul functions with the mind, the will, the emotions, and the spirit. Don't have time to get into that in today, but that is fun. I had a chance to explain it all again this week, and man, it was fun, because I was learning stuff again. <laughs> scares me, you know? <laughs> All right. In the physical realm, though, we know that there are five senses. We hear, we see, hear, taste, touch, and smell. And that is how we understand the physical, three dimensions of the physical realm. We understand them. We, we, get, we see it. We 
hear it, we taste it, we touch it, we smell it. We understand that the senses is how we understand the physical realm. Now, we also have, we see, hear, taste, touch, and smell differently when we're in relationship with people. We see things differently when we talk soul to soul. You see things in people. It's not just physical. You see a change. You see things happening. You hear things different. Mama says, you didn't take out the trash. We heard you're a bad person because you didn't take out the trash. We hear differently than what is really being physically said. We taste, we touch, we smell. These things are true, but we also know that in the spirit realm, we see. Uh, the Lord gives us sight. We hear the voice of God. Uh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Our prayers are sweet-smelling savor before God. And he touched me. God, there's touch in the spirit realm. Now, this is very important that we, we're going to see this in just a second. But these senses are very big. One of the best ways of understanding the senses in the soul realm is just call it discernment. It's when we're discerning people. We're discerning things. And you can say the ones in the, in the spiritual would be vision, maybe, or revelation. Okay? We also know that a person's soul can get messed up. Anybody believe that one? Yeah. A person's soul can get messed up so that it is not functioning the way God intended it to function. We don't think straight. We don't feel straight. We don't want straight. What happens is when sin came into the world, things that were vibrating perfectly according to God's creation was taken out of focus when sin came in and it, it changed the vibrational function. We don't have things in tune. Now, I was playing with this. this we've been talking about tune. When you take a guitar string, okay, when we take a guitar, it's all tuned. Nice to take one string and detune it. And it sounds horrible. Okay? But however, I can take that one string that's detuned and I can play a song on just that one string and it sounds good. Even though... It's functional, but it's out of perfect tune. But it's not in good tune with others. See? <laughs> this is like, wow, we're getting it. Okay, which is really cool. Now, here's the other thing. That's the other way we're talking about, is things were in focus when God made it, and when sin came, it brought things out of focus. Of course, there's people probably in the congregation, I would say, oh, that's better. <laughs> okay. Wash your glasses, Ron, okay? Just, that's all good, buddy. Okay. But what it does is it, it defocuses so you can't get that, that sharp image of what God intended. Okay? Okay. So sin focused us wrong. Since everything was created out of light anyway, so to defocus it, that makes sense. Okay? So it's not focused the way it should be. Now, we also know that in this, that there's, so there's negative they aren't full dimensions, they're just detuned dimensions. They're just out of whack. And that we know that that is true in the spirit realm. That's where the demons live. That's where all this sort of stuff functions. It's not under the beautiful harmony that God created it to be. But sin defocused it, detuned it, so it's out of, out of sync. And we know that this happens in the bodies. Um, anybody here ever have any pain? Sickness? Any problems? <laughs> yeah, that's because the physical has become detuned also. And a sickness and a disease is because the body is not in tune with the things of the spirit. Kind of a big deal. Now, we got all that far to understand that when you're not born again, what do you have? Negativity. You have no spirit. You're not born into the spirit. Brandon needs one. Anybody else need one? Sure, I'll take one. He says, yeah, sure, okay. Um, now, everything else that I'm going to be doing on here is not on there, okay? So, but when, we, when, we get, when we're not born again, what happens is our spirit is dead, and we don't have access to the spirit realm, okay? However, when we get born again, what happens is we are given birth in the spirit, and we are absolutely in our spirit, totally focused and tuned. Totally in harmony with God. How do I know that? Because the Holy Spirit himself is living within my spirit. You can't get better than that. 
Totally, absolutely. People say, how in the world can we access God? Oh, you already have. If, you've been, if you're born again, you already have. How do, we, how do we talk to God? Well, just talk to him. You have absolute perfect um, communion with him in your spirit. Absolutely, totally perfect. Amazing. Okay. That's the kingdom. The kingdom is in the spirit realm. When I am walking in my spirit, that's when I'm walking in the kingdom. How cool is that? Now, that brings us all, that's just all review, not bad. And the more I think about this, the guys, the greater it gets crazy. But let's talk about our senses in the physical. Our physical senses are our focus way much more than we think. Okay? Now, uh, all the time I'm dealing with people who have fallen in some form of sexual sin. Sexual sin focuses you on the physical. Sex, all about that is just getting us into the physical. It drops us in the physical. There's no spiritual, there's not even soul. It drops us into more physical. I mean, there's soul. There's soul ties. There's all, but what it does is this. Let me show you how this works. <laughs> yeah, she gave me this, the, the old stink eye right there. Oh, yeah? Really? Yeah, watch. It's okay. I'm all good. What it does is when we get focused on the physical, it captures our senses of the soul. We get into this. Now, that's just sexual sin. We say sexual sin. No, this is any form of sin. Anytime we're choosing to walk in those kinds of things. Now, you think about it. I, I brought this the sexual because it is so mightily focused on it. Okay? And it just makes people, boom, this is all they're talking about. It's hard to see the things of the spirit realm when that happens. Uh, it takes the priest of the home out of being the priest quicker than anything. There is nothing as fast as sexual sin to take the priest of the home out. Okay, we found this, and if you want verification on that, just read about the Phineas, whole Phineas thing that happened in, in Numbers uh, 24 through 31, all that sort of stuff. And all that happened, how did Balaam get the children of Israel to be cursed? He couldn't curse them, but he got them to walk in the curse because they got into sexual sin. And they walked out from underneath the blessing, and God himself fought them. So... That's, that's the truth. Now, what happens is when we do that, it focuses our soulish senses on the physical and it, it takes us out of the spiritual. It shuts off. Now, it doesn't mean you're not saved. Okay, I did it that way just to show you that there's a block of the things of the spirit realm. Now, I just used one example of sin. We can use a bunch of them, can't we? Drug abuse. Alcohol, right? This is, this is it. What this is, this right here is talking addiction. That's exactly how you explain that thing. Because it gets you so focused. And you're right there. And you're focused. Remember we say that, that being the things of sin unfocuses you of the things of God. But you can focus the light that was in you. If the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? You can focus your darkness into the born things. And think it's light. Am I making sense? Here's the other problem. Physical senses. What happens if you're in pain? What happens when you're in pain? Does that focus your senses? Yeah. yeah. When you have a headache, how's your faith? What faith? That's about it. As soon as your headache comes, it kind of oozes out your toes and it just gets gone, man. There's, some say it doesn't ooze. It just plain flat squirts gone, man. It's just out. Drains completely. Here's the problem. The more we get focused on the disease, the more we're focused on the physical, the less we're focused on the spiritual. Even a sickness or a disease can keep us from walking in the things of the Spirit. Why do you think God came and one of the first things he did, Jesus as a manifestation on the planet, one of the first things he did is start healing people so they could get their focus back on God. You know, yeah, told you. It rocks, doesn't it? 
Okay? So why are we focusing on it? Well, it's the same thing, but we have found out something that we have as a revelation here that not all diseases are physical. What are they? They're soulish. So we're having to bring healing to the soul so we can bring healing to the body so that their focus can get back on the things of the spirit. And the spirit can, can be there to have authority over the soul, etc. You've got to get things in the light pro proper order. Apostolic order. Get first things first and get them to flow. Now, am I making sense so far? Everybody following me? Okay, what's our subject matter? What's today's subject matter? Fasting. Click. Why did God give us fasting so that we could take something of the physical and shut it out? To actually get a key to saying, I'm not going to focus on this anymore. Instead, I'm going to focus on the things of the, on the, things of the soul into the spirit. I'm going to focus up. You see what's going on here? If I go into fasting, what am I doing? I'm actually telling my body senses to shut up for a while so that I can focus on higher senses. Kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Okay, let me explain about prayer. What does prayer do? What did we find out last week when we talked about prayer? We said, Lord, your kingdom come. Now, that, that's not about, Lord, your kingdom come. May your kingdom be hit in Indian Hills. May your kingdom hit Kittredge. May we, 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 that's what we pray for. No, that's not what it's talking about. It says, Lord, may your kingdom come. In other words, find out in me everything that is not of your kingdom. Show it to me so that your kingdom can come into my life. What's happening there? That's exactly it. Is it, Lord, your kingdom come. As he starts explaining those things to us, that's when we start seeing things that need to be taken care of in our soul. Okay, But fasting is the one that breaks the physical connection. It's the one that brings this thing down to where it's something we can do. Now, but I have had so many people tell me, I can't get rid of this thing. I have prayed. I have fasted. I don't always get the courage to ask them this question because this is kind of one, this sounds really interesting, but when you say, and how did you fast? And how did you pray? See, we get into religious prayer and religious fasting. And if it's religious prayer and religious fasting, it will not bring freedom. Religion cannot bring freedom. It's got to be done right. Okay? Just like anything, where the principles have got to be used correctly, right? You've got to use them right. Uh, Jim, have you ever used a Chilton's manual? All, all the time. All the time. What happens when you don't? I tend to break things. <laughs> <laughs> in order. Does it make sense to do things in order? Yep. What happens when you don't do them in order? I tend to break things. They right? don't come apart. They don't come apart like they're supposed to. They come apart. Yeah, I, and if you don't have an a, a automotive manual when you're working on your car, uh, you're, you're winging it. And uh, a lot of people are good at that, doing stuff, but there just comes a certain things. depends on how complex things are getting things out of order, uh, working on the computer parts of your car, right? Disconnect the um, negative terminal on the battery before you start unplugging things. Mm -hmm. Okay, but yeah, there's certain things you have to do in order. And we found this is true about the spirit, soul, and body and how the things function. That's where they're working. Now, I'll back that up and do that again. So that, watch right here, okay? Where my soul is so negatively f focused, the fasting, if I can get things tuned to the things of God, that's when I start getting things focused correctly. Okay? Remember, salvation of the spirit was immediate. Salvation of the soul is a process. It's going to take some time. Okay? And not all of us have obtained the height that Jim has in spiritual <laughs> I had to pick on somebody you just happened to be sitting there alright folks we haven't arrived Paul said that this one thing he says not that I have obtained but this one thing I do forgetting what is past I press on towards the mark of the prize of the high calling 
Okay, we've got to start looking ahead and looking at these things. We can't go against the things that we know is true in Scripture to gain what we want in the things of God. You can't say, well, I can pick and choose what things I'll do and what things I'll obey. Uh, no. <laughs> Does it work? We do it, though. We do it all the time. No, we can't do it. Okay, let's go on. Matthew 4, 1 through 2 says this. Then Jesus was led up in the wilderness by the Spirit to be tempted by the devil. And having for, fasted 40 days and 40 nights afterward, he hungered. Well, yeah, after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he hungered. Yeah, I would think so. Okay. But why did Jesus do this? He was led, by the, led up in the wilderness by the devil, uh, by the Spirit, to be tempted by the devil. Jesus had to get a firm grip on his physical self. Why? Why, what was the timing here? Here he was, 30 years living in the physical as a son to his mother, as a son to his adopted father, doing what? Carpentry work, working, doing all this stuff. Why at the age of 30? Don't know. I've had all sorts of speculation on why it took him that long for the uh, one answer that just answers it all is because God told him to wait until then. That answers it. Okay? We don't know all the ramifications behind it, but we do know that at about the age of 30, he suddenly came to John and he said, Baptize me. And John said, I should be baptized to you. He says, N Just no. Do this so we can fulfill all righteousness. He is baptized of John, and then what? As soon as he came up out of being baptized by John, he was led of the Spirit to go in the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Why? His baptism was his marked inauguration to start doing ministry. And he knew that he had to be in ministry from then on, and he had to be absolutely focused. So what did he do? He went out fasting. Now, if Jesus decides, that for him to be focused in ministry, he needs to fast. What, what are we doing? Eating, Eating mostly. <laughs> of course, it's, it's really a sad thing to be talking about this the day after we all sucked down major amounts of chicken at a certain yeah. lady's party. Okay, no, just like... <laughs> but fasting, Jesus found that it was necessary because he was inextricably connected to the physical just like you are we are in the physical that doesn't mean we have to be ruled by the physical okay Jesus showed us an example that we can also be in this world and have that world as part of it you follow me he was living in this realm in the realm of the physical he knew that but he also had his soul he had to get his soul completely aligned, and he had to make sure that he was listening to the things of the Spirit. So he put things into proper order. Taught his body, no body, we're not going to do that. We're going to do this. We've got to get that together. He needed to know it so that he could minister. He needed to know it so that he could minister. So what was it that he actually did? Well, he laid down his soul. He laid down his soul. He said, my soul is not what's important. It's what the Father wants that's important. He laid down his soul. He learned love, Hebrew says. He learned it by suffering. He had to suffer. This is not talking about he learned obedience through suffering when he went to the cross. He had to learn obedience by suffering long before he went to the cross. Okay? He gained a true focus. Okay? You say, but Jesus was sinless. Yes. Yes, he was. But he didn't live in a world that was fallen. Yes. What did he do? He made sure that he was not affected by the sin around him. Okay? He had to. Matthew 17, 19 through 21 says this, Then coming up to Jesus privately, the disciples said, why were we not able to cast him out? Now you've got to understand that they had this, this kid that had this evil spirit. And 
he was thrashing them and throwing them in all sorts of fire and everything else. And, and they tried to cast this thing out and couldn't. Now, it was not an issue of authority. Because he had already given them authority over the spirits. It was an issue. Let's go on here. <laughs> Why were we not able to cast him out? And Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief. It wasn't had to do with authority. It had to do with their unbelief. Listen, you have authority. You have more authority than you've ever even known you have. You have almost absolute and total authority. Then how come you have problems? Because you don't understand your authority and you don't believe. That's the biggest key. That's the biggest key. How much authority do you have? A lot more than you think. Okay? But then he says, this is because of your unbelief. For truly I say to you, if you have faith as a grain of a mustard... You will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. And nothing shall be impossible to you. And we haven't gotten to the point where nothing shall be impossible to you, faith. Anybody? Gotten there yet? Okay, why? Because we aren't understanding the realms that we are supposed to be walking in and why, what tags us to where we're supposed to be. And he said, but at the end of it, he says, but this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. Is Faith is hindered by physical sight and by physical realm and by physical whatevers. If we do not have the physical under control, we'll not see about these kinds of demons. Now, you've got to understand something. When you find one of these, it doesn't mean now is the time you go fasting. Now, you better have a fasted life before you ever encounter him. Okay? Jesus did stop and go fasting when he saw it. What? But he had all his senses under control, so it wasn't what he was seeing in the physical that was concerning him. He was asking the Father, so how's this happened? What's going on? And I says, you know, and, and it just, they had this conversation. Then he saw the crowd coming and realized that with the crowd coming, things are going to get a lot more difficult, a lot of problems that are going to ensue. And he says, I saw the crowd coming. He just shut off the interview and just said, come out of him. Thrashed him and went out. Okay? Boom. He just watched the whole thing. He was in control of what was going on around him. It wasn't the physical that was controlling it. It was much more than that. In Matthew chapter 9, 14, 15, it says this, Then the disciples of John came to him, came to Jesus, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast a whole bunch? And your disciples do not fast. And he says, Jesus said to them, Can the sons of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom will have been taken from them, and then they will fast. Why? He's showing a big difference here. He's showing that there's times of celebration and there's times of work. Okay? The, the Jewish festivals were called... <laughs> Feast days, not fast days. So seven times of the year they came together to do what? Suck down food. They enjoyed it most thoroughly and it's good food. Okay? But that wasn't what it was all about. There are times of celebration and there's times of work. But the issue here was Jesus, not religion. They're saying we fast. There's a specific we have to do with this. It's just like boom, 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 we're fasting. What about your guys? You know, he says, ah, that's not what it's about. There'll be a come a day when they will be fasting. Trust me. But right now, they're just listening to me. Okay, that's, that's fun. Luke 18, 11 through 12 says this. The Pharisee was standing praying these things to himself, which I think is a funny way of saying it, praying these things to himself. Actually, what it means is he was not saying it out loud. But it's funny that he's, the, the wording of that is he's praying to himself. That, Anyway, there's probably more truth to that than we think. And the Pharisee was standing, praying these things to himself. God, I thank you that I am not as the rest of men, rapacious, unrighteous, adulterers, or even as this lowly tax collector. For I fast twice on the Sabbath. I tithe all things as many as I get. And it goes on. I had had enough. Just these verses, that's good enough. Okay? 
He says he fa fasts twice on the Sabbath. Now this makes it sound like he fasts twice every Sabbath, every Saturday, Friday night and Saturday. And that's not true. That's not what he's talking about. There is one prescribed fast in the law. Only one. Okay? And that's in the latter um, festivals. And so it's during, you know, when you have the Rosh Hashanah going into the Day of Atonement. And then after that is the, the Feast of Festivals. But it just goes quite... There's a, a prescribed fast then. Well, the Pharisees took it way beyond. And they did two fasts during that time. We fast twice during the Sabbaths. And they also prescribed two fast days between Passover and Pentecost. Which is not prescribed by law. And so he's, he's in there saying, I, I fast twice in the Sabbaths. What, nobody's impressed? Yeah. Okay, that's what it's talking about. He says, I tithe all things. And he says, not as this, this tax collector, this scum of the earth. But the tax collector wouldn't even lift up his eyes and said, Oh Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus said, Now which one left justified? Which one left changed? The tax collector. It says it had nothing to do with fasting at that point because the fasting was only for open show. Folks, fasting for the wrong reason will just make you hungry. Fasting for the right reason is totally different. Totally different. Added fast twice a year. It pumped him up. It didn't humble him. It pumped him up. It didn't humble him. Okay? Pride-filled religious comparisons. Fasting pumped him up in his religiosity. I'm going to read this to you. I didn't put it up there, and you'll have to just trust me. But in Isaiah chapter 58, this was in the Word, and the Pharisees missed it. The Pharisees missed it. But I've got to read this to you, because this is, this is like too good. This is Isaiah chapter 58. <clears throat> Verse 1, call out with a throat, do not spare. Lift up your voice like the ram's horn and show my people their rebellion and their sins to the house of Jacob. Yet they seek me day by day. They desire knowledge of my ways as a nation that has done right and not forsaken the judgment of their God. They ask me about judgments of righteousness, the desire to draw near to God. That sounds really good. Then verse 3, it says, they say, why have we fasted and you did not see? We have afflicted our soul, and you did not acknowledge. Behold, on the day of your fast, you find pleasure, and you drive all your laborers hard. He says, what good is it when you say, I'm doing fasting, if on the days you're fasting, you're still messing up other people? You're still hurting other people. That's not it. He says, look, he said in verse 4, you fast for strife and for debate and to strike with the fist of wickedness. Do not fast as today to sound your voice in the high place. Is this like the fast I will choose? A day for a man to afflict his soul? To bow his head down like a bulrush and he spreads sackcloth and ashes? Will you call to this as a fast and a day of delight to Jehovah? He said, I don't think so. Verse 6. Is this not the fast I have chosen, to open the bands of wickedness, to undo thongs of the yoke, and to let the oppressed ones go free, even that you pull off every yoke? Is it not to break your bread to the hungry, and that you should bring the wandering poor home? When will you see the naked and cover him, and when will you not hide yourself from the flesh? Then your light will break as the dawn, and your healing shall spring up quickly, and your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of Jehovah shall gather you. Then you shall call, and Jehovah will answer. You shall call, and he shall say, Here I am. If you put the yoke away from among you, and sending out of the finger, and the speaking of vanity. And if you let out your soul to the hungry, and satisfy the afflicted soul, then your light shall rise in the darkness, and your gloom shall be as the noonday. And Jehovah shall always guide you and satisfy your soul in dry places and support your bones. And you shall be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. 
Okay, well, I, I can't let that out. And those who come of you shall build of the old ruins, and you shall rear the foundations of many generations, and you'll be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to live in. Okay, what's he talking about? Man, he's saying, okay, what are you going to do? He says, if your fasting does not make you love people and help deal, deal with things in people's lives, if your fasting does not make you love, you're fasting the wrong way. The deal here is love. Jesus wanted to take, take hold of fasting. Why? He laid down his soul. What is it? Greater love has no man than this, that a man laid down his soul for his friends. Jesus wanted to do that. He did that at the beginning of his ministry, not just at the end. Yes, we see him doing it again just before the crucifixion because he's going to be crucified. Hello, pay attention. You know? But he had to lay down his soul on a regular basis. So could I, would it be true to say that we fast to change not external things, but to change internal things? Absolutely right. Absolutely straight. We, we fast to change things on the inside, not on the outside. Matthew 6, 17 and 18. We're back to Matthew 6. I, we did, we, did you see, it wasn't a good long route around just to go to here. Yeah. <laughs> Matthew 6, 17 and 18 says, But you in fasting, anoint your head, wash your face. People go, what does that mean? Well, back then, they slicked themselves back with, with oil to get themselves looking good. Okay? Anoint your head, wash your face, get dressed up, look good, look fine. Don't look like you're doing anything weird. So as not to appear to men to be fasting. But your father in secret and your father seeing in secret will repay you in the open. How is he going to repay you? We've been talking about this thing about reward. What's the reward of the prophet? The word of the prophet. What's the reward he's going to do here? The reward is the effect of the fasting. The reward is a changed life that's going to actually affect people. And it's going to be, bring food to the hungry. And it's going to bring clothes to the naked. It's going to, going to take care of people. And it's going to do what is necessary to help the people around you. Right. The whole deal is to work for the meat of heaven. Which is what we're trying to get. Is what? The kingdom to function. How do you get the kingdom to come here? It begins with fasting. Okay? That's a way. A big way. Okay? You do it on purpose and with a good attitude. You do it on purpose and with a good attitude. Now, my dad, my, my poor little dad, he never did get the concept of fasting. And what he would say all the time is, well, I don't like fasting. It gives me a headache. Okay, dad, that's simple. There's a reason why it gives you a headache. Because you're burning low-grade fuel and you're actually getting the toxins out of your cells and they're coming around your body and they will give you a toxic headache. Yes, it will. You say, well, you're not really selling this real well, Lee. You're supposed to make this, you know, make it wonderful. And I'm not going to even begin to tell you that fasting is fun. No religion. If we do this with any religion, nullifies it. All it does is make you hungry for a day. It might be good for your waistline. You will gain the reason you fast when you do it right. You do it the way he says, do it for your father. Do it because it's a relationship with your father. And again, he says, not your God, but your father seeing in secret will pay you in the open. The relationship with him, the father seeing in secret will pay you in the open. What's going to happen is out in the open, the effects of your fasting is going to show up. You're going to love people. You're going to do the things that are necessary. So fasting. Are restricting physical impulses. Now, there's a lot of things we can fast, not just food. But food is the primary. That's what it's talking about normally when it talks about fasting, is fasting food. Okay? Um, but you could fast other things. You can fast television. You can fast fishing. You can, fa <laughs> you can fast movies. You can, yeah, you can have a much faster church. What? No. Um... There's certain things that you can fast that are going to be, uh, that are sensual inputs that you just shut off. You shut off for a period. Okay? Um, bringing physical senses under control usually starts with food. 
it heightens other senses. And that is true. Okay, that is true. When my body is under control and I've been fasting, it's amazing how much other senses. And now that I understand more about soulish senses and how that discernment works, it's been kind of amazing that when I do a fast, when I do fasting, it's amazing what I see in discernment in the soul realm. Okay, it's really kind of amazing, really fun. Humbling our selfishness is exactly the key to it. That's exactly what it's about. Only between the Lord and myself. Okay, only between the Lord and myself. Making me his vessel. Not my own. I'm his vessel. I've got to make sure I know that. No religion. The outcome is love of others. We've got to make sure there's no religion. Now, let's get practical for a second. Start slow. If you've not been used to fasting, start slow. I've known guys that say, I need to fast, and they start off with a 20-day fast. No, just not wise. Okay? Stop your fast smooth too, okay? Uh, we knew a guy that did a 40-day fast and stopped it with a pound of M&Ms. Oh, oh, God. Did he go to the hospital? Pretty close. Pretty close. He, uh, yeah. So he says, and I'm not doing that again. So the next time he did a 40-day fast, and of course he didn't do a total. He did a, like 20 total just with, with liquids. And then uh, he did like a loaf of, or not a loaf of bread, but a slice, a couple slices of bread a day kind of a thing and he says I'm not doing that M&M thing and so he stopped it with a pot roast dinner okay it took twice before he figured out that wasn't smart so now he's a little bit smarter okay I'm sorry what's say? he hasn't done a 40 day fast since I think he's figured it out okay it is rather an amazing start slow but listen missing one meal will not kill you now, I have to give all the medical disclaimers, okay? If you're diabetic, do it carefully, okay? Watch your blood sugar levels. There's a ways of cutting out certain foods and getting good to others, and you know, there's nice ways. But most of you do not have that problem. Most of you just have a selfish problem. <laughs> it just doesn't, doesn't like it, doesn't like to do this, okay? Tell your body to submit. You got to bring it in. Now, here's here's. I'll just be practical on this. A one day fast is the hardest, really, because what's happening the whole time is you're fasting. Your stomach is shrinking because you're not putting any food in there, so it's kind of like shrinking up a bit. That's what's called hunger pangs, and it's just like it's just shriveling up a little bit. Okay, it will get down in about a day. The second day of a of a three-day fast, the second day is a piece of cake. Third day is not a problem. That first day. So when you do a one-day fast, what are you doing? You're just fasting just long enough to feel the pain of it. <laughs> That's good. Okay. Should you fast? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Should you do it right? Oh, yeah. Amen. Absolutely. Okay. Do it carefully. Do it carefully. And your fast eggs and bacon no and you're fast carefully juices and you know breads and simple stuff huh veggies. yeah you can do veggies there are all sorts of different kinds of fast there's a Daniel fast which for days you'd eat nothing but just vegetables that's cool that'll do something for you a lot of people do fasting for health reasons that's not my concern my concern is not physical health my concern is physical domination. <laughs> Focus on higher issues. Um, a, lot, a lot of people say, well, I fasted a meal. And during that time that they fasted, they watched a movie, they did something else, whatever. The idea is to focus on higher issues. Put some prayer in. Pray, don't whine. Because all you're doing is complain to the Father. It's the same thing, attitude. What's the, what's, what's the fasting for? It's to get your body under control. And listen, most of us, it wouldn't hurt us to miss a meal or two a week. Really, folks, we're not hurting, okay? Increase from one meal. 
Increase, you know, do one meal fast, do one meal fast. Increase to a day. And when I mean a day, what I mean by that is you eat an evening meal, and then the next day you eat nothing, and then the next day you have a breakfast. When I say a day, I mean a day. 24 hours. Not a Muslim. Just, why? Because we're trying to get the physical under control. We're trying to get it so that it does... We're trying to get more understanding of the kingdom. But wait a minute, if we keep focusing on the physical, how much more of the kingdom are we going to be getting? So here's what's going to be happening. There's a certain strange kind of baldish pastor person that I do know. Some. That is going to be calling his church to some fasts where the entire church is going to be fasting and praying for a day. Okay? Why? Do we want the move of the kingdom? Now, one thing I did talk to Mike, Mike Sharp about this week is that they've had these guys that are, are part of the transformation movement. I don't know if you've seen the, the videos, transformations videos, where they they get one whole town where they, they're praying and praying and it transforms the entire city where the city is breaking out of drug cartels and different things and it's just it's very, very impressive. But they have the people that are trying to talk Mike into doing the transformation stuff and um, he's been, he's just something about it didn't feel right and so he started talking to this guy about, about this and he says, as a question in all your history of all your cities that have been through the transformation, have you ever had one where the people were not desperate? He says, oh no, the people have to get desperate. And he says, okay, how do you do that? You see, one person being desperate is not enough. Now what has happened is the whole revivals have broken out because one person was desperate and prayed for 20 years. Okay, that does happen. But if we want a move of God to come through Indian Hills, to come through Kittredge, to come through Evergreen, to come through the mountain areas, to come down the 285 corridor, well, that's our territory, folks. But who's going to be desperate enough to get it? See, we all want it. We'd love to see all more people coming through the door. But are we desperate enough to do it? Are we desperate? I mean, we have that song. I'm desperate for you. Really? See, Rick Whitehill wouldn't sing that song, would he? No, he will now. He will now. Yeah, but for a while, he wouldn't. Why? Because he didn't say, I'm not really desperate, so I can't sing it. In reality. It's true, folks. Do, are we desperate? Are we desperate for a healing of our marriages? Are we desperate for a healing of our bodies? Are we desperate for a healing of our communities? Are we desperate for a healing of our children? Are we desperate? For, what? Are we desperate? No, we're not. What's it going to take? Well, I think we're going to have to increase and not do any religion, but we're going to have to have the benefit of a fasted life where we are breaking the physical so that the spiritual will be functional. Remember that? It's the senses. Now you're starting to see when we get the senses of the physical to drag the senses of the, of the soulish into them. We're focused in the wrong direction. That's causing the altar of incense to have incense pointed towards us. That's worshiping us. It's exactly what it's all about. Fasting is what breaks that thing and it causes us to have a focus of the things of the Spirit. But what's the reason for it? The reason is to get our soul tuned to the things of God and then we're going to find out that's laying down of our soul. We're going to have love for others. But here's, here's the deal, is do we want the things of the Spirit? Well, put your money where your mouth is. Instead of putting your food where your mouth is. <laughs> it's time for us to really find out, are we willing to fast and pray? Are we willing to break it? Are we willing to break the yoke? And then he says that, and then he releases you to this whole big table of pastries and this whole, all these <laughs> wonderful boxes of bread and everything else we got down here. It says, okay, yeah, let's, uh, yeah. but it's not, today is not a fast day, so it's all good. It's a, uh... 
There's a little Catholic institution <laughs> that drove me crazy, still does. It's up on Highway 34. It takes almost a four-wheel drive to get up to it. Um, met this lady, this, um, this nun that lives up there, Sister Lucille. And uh, uh, I heard that they have a thing called Pustinia. And that's a Russian word meaning wilderness. And so I got to talk to this lady. And she says, what they have is they have these two cabins that are absolutely gorgeous. Made out of... Uh, wood log cabins made, oh, they're just amazing and inside them is a bed a table a chair a stand for, for washing your face and a wood stove that's it there's a porta potty down the road that's it no electricity, kerosene lamp there's no electricity and she says, you're up here to fast and pray. The minimum you can come up for fast and pray is a 24-hour. But she says, she almost always requires a 48-hour fast. But she let me off with the 24. I had an issue that I was not getting the answer on. And I said, I've got to hear from God on this. So I, I'm going to go up and do a fast at Sister Lucille's, and I'm going to go up there. So got everything ready. No guitar. No harmonica. No cell phone. No computer. All you're allowed is a Bible, a pen, and a notebook. Now, I got up there, and she says, normally she greets you and takes you right to the cabins and gets you all set up and everything. She says, I'm counseling with this girl in, in my house for, for a while. Can you come back in an hour? And I said, sure. She says, I mean, you can go hiking. You can do whatever you want. It's all our property. Just, you know, I'll talk to you in an hour. She says, fine. So I didn't put my stuff in the cabin because I wasn't cleared there yet. And so I kept it on the car and just went for a hike. And I got up on top of this peak up there. It took me about 20 minutes to get up this little area, and the wind was really blowing. And so I, I sat down in the shade of a tree right there. I hadn't even started my 24 hour thing. I sat down in the shade of a tree, kind of sheltered from the wind. And I sat there and said, Lord, I'm up here this, you know, for this day to get an answer for this issue. And He answered me right there. And I went, Oh no. <laughs> oh no I could hear the giggles from the throne the Lord said, ah, 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 got you ah, ah. oh no you're kidding I mean how many times do you really get an answer from God and you go oh no you know it's usually yeah I got the answer and I, I understood immediately so I went back down in my hour and she, she was there she says okay come on and she got me into my cabin she gave you water there it is. I'm here for, for a day. Started at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. I was done by 3. And I had nothing going. I sat there and said, Okay, Lord, what do you want to do? Total silence from the throne. Except a little giggle now and then. And I just went, Oh, no. I was unplugged. I had no computer, I had no guitar, I didn't do anything that I normally do to, to fill time. I didn't have books to read, I had one book to read, and that was my Bible. I sat down, I started reading, I read massive chunks of scripture. I took notes on stuff, man, it was just like, it was, it came time that it was dark, fine, I'm going to go to bed, I'm going to sleep for eight no, I wasn't sleepy. I sat awake. It is unusual for me. I'm just like, you're kidding. So the only thing I had for entertainment was a hundred flies and moths that came in. I didn't even have a rubber band. Folks, you understand, that would have been fun. I had, I had a fly swatter. So I'm chasing these things down. That's, that was my entertainment. Okay. I went to bed. I finally got to sleep about 11 you think, well, that means I'd probably sleep in? No, my normal 5.30, I was 
awake and ready to go. Come on. The Lord's just still laughing at me. Folks, that was one of the hardest 24-hour periods I have ever spent. Because all I want to do is just hear from God. And he says, okay, you're going to hear from God? You're going to hear from God more than you had anticipated. And I learned how plugged in I am. So just what Jared was saying is so right. And uh, so very, very fascinating. And I can give you Sister Lucille's number. Anybody want to go for a... I don't want to make it sound bad because it wasn't bad. It was absolutely amazing. And then I sat down at the end of my 24 hours, sat down with um, Sister Lucille, and we shared life experiences. And she tells you, yeah, she's a Catholic nun, but she intercedes for you while you're in the cabin. And when you are out, she gives you a prophetic word. Yeah, you better better be ready to have your have your mail read, <laughs> because she she'll tell you exactly. What, and it was a, a vastly amazing experience. But folks, we are plugged in way too much, way too much. So, did you get something from that this morning? I hope I'm reeling you in, because this has nothing to do with theology anymore. This has to do with practicality of getting into the higher dimensions. We're there. All right? Father God, I thank you. I thank you, Lord, so much for today. Lord, as you touch our lives. Lord, I just give you praise. May we be tuned to you. And I just love you, Lord. Lord, bring us to the point where we are physically not so connected to the physical. But we are discerning and totally open to the things of the spirit realm. And I just give you praise and glory, Lord, in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen.